The Chief Petty Officer Since 1893, chiefs have been the United States Navy's senior enlisted leaders. The transition from Petty Officer First Class to Chief Petty Officer, pay grades E6 to E7, is a change unique amongst the armed services. A sailor attaining the rate of Chief Petty Officer takes on a whole new look, earns a whole new level of respect, and incurs a whole new level of responsibilities and expectations. Chief Petty Officers train junior enlisted personnel in the Navy as well as officers. Chief Petty Officers lead by example. In fact, through the years, 46 chiefs have earned the Medal of Honor. This presentation is an adaptation of one I developed 20 years ago. I've given the live presentation of this to well over 10,000 Chief Petty Officers and Chief Selectees at places ranging from the United States Navy Memorial, the Navy Senior Enlisted Academy in Newport, Rhode Island, and USS Constitution, Old Ironsides, in Boston. Through artifacts and images, we'll explore the evolution of enlisted leadership in the U.S. Navy. In the days of the Continental Navy and the early days of the U.S. Navy, there was only one level of petty officer. This custom was borrowed from the British Royal Navy and would continue for a century. Early petty officers didn't even wear anything on their uniforms to indicate their positional authority. It wasn't until 1833 that petty officers were granted a badge of rank. This was a three-inch tall anchor worn on the left sleeve by some petty officers, on the right by others. By the time of the Civil War, the insignia had changed to include an American eagle and a five-pointed star. The design of those three elements changed shape immediately after the Civil War, but we were still with only one grade of petty officer. It wasn't until the mid-1880s that the Navy broke its petty officers out into three distinct rates. Third class being the lowest, second class in the middle, first class being the most senior. By this time, the Navy realized it needed enlisted leadership at multiple different levels. And to reinforce that concept, the Navy gave that senior, the first class petty officer, a brand new distinctive uniform. This consisted of a double-breasted coat and tie and a visor cap. With the first class's new uniform, the Navy sent a visible signal to its sailors, acknowledging the trust and confidence it had in its enlisted leadership. In March of 1893, the Navy decided to add a new rate of petty officer, chief petty officer. While the term chief had been used in the Navy all the way back to the days of the Revolution, it was only used as a job title for divisional or departmental positions. It was never an actual term of rank. Nine ratings were the first to be authorized the rate of Chief Petty Officer. These included Master at Arms, Boatswain's Mate, Quartermaster, Gunner's Mate, Machinist, later known as Machinist's Mate, Carpenter's Mate, Yeoman, Apothecary, later called Hospital Corpsman, and Bandmaster. These new chiefs inherited the uniform that up till then had been worn by the first class petty officers and adopted the rating badge of the style that had been worn by the master at arms. Three chevrons pointed down, three arcs above it, an eagle, and a specialty mark. For the next nine years, the term chief just seemed to be a new title. Chiefs continued to mess and berth with other petty officers and didn't seem to be viewed much differently than them. But in 1902, there came a change. For the first time, Navy regulations authorized chief petty officers to mess separately from the other petty officers and the other enlisted members of the crew. This change was significant. It was yet another sign by the Navy 
that it was putting trust and confidence into its most senior enlisted leaders. Several years before this, in 1897, came another significant change for chief petty officers, the creation of a new cap badge. Up to that point, they'd been wearing the same cap badge that the first class petty officers had worn. The 1897 Chief Petty Officer Cap device was described in Navy Uniform Regulations as follows. The device shall be the letters USN in silver upon a gilt foul, F-O-U-L, anchor. With variations, this insignia is worn by chiefs to this very day. Let's take a quick minute to look at the evolution of the chief's anchor. In 1905, regulations said the device shall be of metal containing the letters USN in silver upon a slightly inclined gilt foul, F-O-U-L, anchor. 1922, cap device shall be a brass foul, F-O-U-L, anchor, gold plated. 1951 regs shall consist of gold color metal foul, F-O-U-L, anchor. You've obviously picked up on my emphasis of the word foul, F-O-U-L. And some might have even noticed that that's the title of this presentation. Well, there's a reason for that. Every edition of U.S. Navy uniform regulations up to 1978, any time it described an anchor on a button, cap device, whatever, that was entwined by its own rope or chain, it used the nautically and grammatically correct foul, F-O-U-L, anchor, as opposed to today, when the expression fouled anchor is used. As the Bureau of Naval Personnel tried to put together its 1978 uniform regulations, they sent it to numerous key people to review for accuracy for errors. And somebody, somebody who obviously was not a mariner, looked and saw the word foul in front of anchor and said, shouldn't this be fouled, F-O-U-L-E-D? Yeah, sure and then went through uniform regs and changed every reference to a foul anchor to the incorrect fouled anchor. Now, why is this incorrect? Well, because of the way our language works. Foul, F-O-U-L, is an adjective. If I hit a baseball outside the lines, it is a foul ball. If an aircraft carrier flight deck is obstructed so that planes can't land, it's referred to as a foul deck. When it's raining, sailors put on foul weather gear. If you don't empty your garbage can for two weeks, you will have a foul smell emanating from it. And sometimes, if I get a little too irritated, I'm said to have a foul mouth. I make this point for a reason. Chief Petty Officers in the Navy are expected to be the go-to people to get the correct information. Ask the Chief. It is incumbent upon them to know how to find the correct information so that they can lead their sailors in the right direction. So now, any chiefs or chief selectees who might be watching this know the truth that the insignia they wear is a foul, F-O-U-L, anchor. Superimposed on this anchor are the letters U-S-N. Somewhere along the line in the last several decades, somebody tried to create an alternative meaning for these letters, unity, service, and navigation. But that misses a much more important point. With the establishment of this cap device, the Navy placed a new visible symbol of its trust and confidence and the authority of Navy chiefs. Any time from this point forward, when a sailor was speaking to a chief, he could see that the chief spoke on behalf of and with the authority of and represented the United States Navy. Here we see an early example of the chief petty officer's blue dress coat. This dates from 1898 to 1912, based on the placement of the rating badge. If we take a close look at the rating specialty mark, you see a circle made of silver bullion wire. 
on a cloth embroidered rating badge, you'd be able to tell much more clearly what this is intended to be because it has lines of longitude and latitude. It is a globe. Now, why would the electrician have a globe as its specialty mark? Well, when the rating was established, it was asked, what symbol should we use for the specialty mark for this rating? And the answer came back, a globe. Duh. Yeah, well, I didn't understand it either until a number of years ago, I was at my grandmother's house, and she said, would you go up in the hall closet and get me a globe? The lights burned out down here. So what they meant was not the globe, Earth. What they meant was a light bulb, which would make sense. But the electrician rating decided they've given us the world and we're going to keep it, and it remains the insignia of electrician's mates to this day. This uniform is from a chief petty officer just after World War I. You see on the lower left arm is a service stripe or a hash mark. And on the upper sleeve, you see the rating badge. That strange looking device is an old fashioned box camera. This is a photographer's mate. Between the rating badge and the hash mark is a rather unusual symbol. And virtually every time, not virtually, every single time I've given this presentation live, I've asked people to identify it. And there's always one person who will say it's a pineapple. It is not, in fact, a pineapple. It is a shell with a lit fuse. Old-fashioned spherical cannonballs that had been hollowed out on the inside and filled with gunpowder were referred to as shells. Now there was a port there that you could put a fuse into so when you fired the cannonball as it got toward its destination the fuse would burn down inside of the powder and smash the shell apart into huge, huge pieces and therefore take out more bad guys. This is the insignia of a seaman gunner. Once a sailor had demonstrated that he knew how to man every position on a deck gun crew he was given this qualification of seaman gunner. This is a forerunner of the warfare specialty insignia that are worn today, such as surface warfare, air warfare, and so on. But it's also an indication that the Navy is expecting still more out of its chief petty officers. It's no longer enough that chiefs know how to work electricity or take photographs or sell pineapple or whatever. They have to know all kinds of things about the Navy and the ship, enough that if any one of their sailors needs information, they can go to that chief and get it. In the years between World War I and World War II, the size of the Navy decreased significantly. In June 1938, the U.S. Navy had 380 ships and 119,088 sailors. For comparison's sake, the U.S. Navy in November 2020 had 296 ships in commission and 344,000 active sailors plus 101,000 reservists. During World War II, the size of the U.S. Navy became gargantuan. In order to fight a war on two sides of the globe, the United States Navy grew to the point toward the end of the war, August 1945, that it had 6,768 ships in commission. That's not talking about small craft, small boats, landing craft, PT boats. This is ships in commission with USS in front of their title. From its manpower strength in 1938 of 119,000 sailors, the Navy grew by August of 1945 grew to 3,405,825 sailors. In just four years, whole new classes and types of ships that hadn't even been dreamt of were designed, built, and put to sea. Newly created technologies required new ratings. Whole new units that didn't exist before the war, such as construction battalions, were created. Here we see another example of an electrician's mate. And this is being worn on the service gray uniform. Just prior to the war, a service khaki uniform had been developed, such as this one here. And there were plans to replace it with the gray uniform, but you never got 100% success. You see photographs in the Navy during World War II with some chiefs and officers wearing the gray uniform and some wearing the khaki uniform. 
Now, you notice I said chiefs and officers. Here is yet another move by the Navy to demonstrate its faith in the authority and responsibility that they have given to chief petty officers. They allow chiefs and officers to wear these same two uniforms. What was clear with this rapid expansion of the Navy is that we couldn't create chief petty officers the way we had before. That is to say, with many years of experience, like this chief pharmacist mate who'd been in at least 16 years, he has four good conduct medals showing that he hadn't been caught doing anything bad. He had been in Nicaragua, the third ribbon, the end ribbon, with the uh, vertical stripes on it with the Marines between the wars, and the American Defense Service Medal, which was issued to everyone in the military who was on active duty on December 7, 1941. The Navy had no choice but to take experienced technical experts like our electrician's mate and put them in positions of responsibility. From there, it was up to the other chiefs in the chief petty officer's mess or goat locker, because that's where all the old goats hang out, to teach these new chiefs everything they needed to know about the Navy in order to help their sailors. That condition continues to this day. Each year, a selection board chooses the coming year's chief petty officers. Between the time when the results are announced from the board until the new chiefs put on their new uniforms, all the chiefs in the mess come together to teach the new skills and concepts that the young chiefs are going to need very, very soon. But one of the most important lessons that they will learn is that a whole community, a whole group, the whole chief's mess can work together to solve problems that one individual chief probably can't do on his or her own. Now, I had mentioned that chiefs and officers wore the same khaki and gray uniforms going through World War II. But chiefs continued to wear different service dress white and service dress blue uniforms, both of which had four pairs, eight buttons, which were smaller than the ones worn by officers. However, as a result of that rapid expansion during the war, many sailors who had been selected for chief petty officer would also go on to become selected for warrant officer or even commission officer ranks. Obviously, having to change out complete uniforms was a waste of vital resources. So late in the war, the Navy authorized the six-button service dress blue coat for chief petty officers. Now, while this was a matter of practicality, it further demonstrated that continuing trust and confidence in the Navy's chief petty officers. After World War II, the Navy shrank in size, and anybody who was fortunate enough to become a chief petty officer during the war really had no further upward mobility. Here you see a chief bosun's mate who had made it in relatively short order. And one interesting thing to note, you see that his rating badge with the crossed anchors, the chevrons, and the eagle is on his right sleeve. That's how it was done up through 1947 for deck ratings. But you notice that the service stripes, the hash marks, were always worn by everybody on the left sleeve. In 1958, all of the armed forces were standardized so that they would have nine enlisted rates or ranks. This would give the Navy two new rates at the E-8 and E-9 level. These would be dubbed Senior Chief for the E-8, as that individual is senior to other Chief Petty Officers. And the E-9 would be called Master Chief Petty Officer, as Master Sergeant had been used in other branches of the armed forces. Colloquially, these two new rates were referred to as Super Chiefs. The appointment of new senior chiefs and master chiefs was based on total time in service and total time as a chief petty officer. And there was also a finite number that they could go ahead and advance. Chief petty officers constituted about 6.5% of the total enlisted force. Seniors would be 2.5% and master chiefs would be little over 1% of the entire enlisted Navy force. So there were some chiefs who were a bit disappointed they didn't get chosen, and some of them came up with little ditties that said, well, despite your new insignia and your new titles and the stars in the mess, we're all chiefs in here. So even though it was originally an expression of sour grapes on those who didn't get appointed to be a super chief, it is still used today amongst U.S. Navy chief petty officers that they are all on one team 
And if they work together, they can make miracles happen. Now, to distinguish these new chiefs, they would add a star above the rating badge for Senior Chief Petty Officer and two stars above the rating badge of Master Chief Petty Officer. Initially, the stars were sold as a separate piece of cloth that was sewn on immediately above the rating badge. Nowadays, they're embroidered all together. In 1959, collar devices were developed for Chief, Senior Chief, and Master Chief Petty Officers. They would take a smaller version of the cap device with the USN and FOUL, F-O-U-L, anchor, using that for Chiefs, and then adding a single star or two stars above it for Senior Chiefs and Master Chiefs. At this time, the Navy made yet another momentous decision. The possibility was discussed of wearing the anchor on the right collar and then the rating specialty mark on the left collar, the way that Staff Corps officers such as doctors and chaplains do. But the Navy decided anchors on both collars. This decision is important because from the moment a new chief puts on the new uniform, in any uniform other than service dress blue that has the full rating badge, all they're going to see is anchors. The only thing they're going to be able to tell is that that individual is a chief. They're not going to know if it's a chief bosun's mate, a chief yeoman, a chief hospital corpsman. All they're going to know is that individual is a chief, and I know that I can go to him or her to get the answers and the guidance that I need. In 1957, the Marine Corps came up with an interesting concept. They wanted to select one Marine, a Sergeant Major, from amongst the ranks of all their Sergeants Major, to be a senior leader and advisor to the Commandant of the Marine Corps on matters dealing with enlisted Marines. They call this individual the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. The Navy had had this concept in different forms over the years, but never on a service-wide scale. In early days, the Master at Arms was a senior enlisted leader on board a ship. In submarines, you had a chief of the boat who was the senior enlisted leader. In 1967, though, the Navy decided to follow the Marines' model. They were going to choose one Master Chief Petty Officer to be a senior enlisted leader and senior enlisted advisor to the Chief of Naval Operations. And they dubbed this individual the Senior Enlisted Advisor of the Navy. Now, you know the military is good for wanting to make up acronyms, so the acronym for this was SEAN, S-E-A-N. So in short order, the Navy decided to go ahead and follow the Marines model and name this individual the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. And here's our first MCPON, Delbert Black. And you can see on his sleeve that they have added a third star above his gunner's mate rating bat. Along with Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, the Navy also added new rates for senior enlisted leaders at other levels. So you had a Master Chief Petty Officer of the Fleet, you had a Master Chief Petty Officer of the Force, and a Master Chief Petty Officer of the Command. These titles, though, seemed a little bit unwieldy, and so eventually they were modified to Fleet Master Chief, Force Master Chief, and Command Master Chief. So now you have senior enlisted leaders at all levels able to advise their commanding officers on matters dealing with the benefits and welfare of their enlisted sailors. Here you see Jackie DeRosa, who rose from being a Master Chief Hospital Corpsman to a Command Master Chief, to the Force Master Chief Petty Officer of the Bureau of Medicine and Surgery, the Navy Medical Department, and also became the first female Fleet Master Chief, Fleet Master Chief of Fleet Forces Command. Up until 1969, Chiefs of all grades wore the same cap device, the foul anchor. But in 1969, a single star was added to the Senior Chief's cap device, and if you take a look at this particular one, you see an old and a new version. The old one, the star's down on the stock, and you couldn't quite see it, so they moved it up so that it's sitting over the ring. And then they added two stars to Master Chief Petty Officer. To Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, they added a third star, just as they did with the rating badge. The Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy works with the highest leaders in the service to help shape policy that will make our enlisted sailors better them and their families. In fact, the MCPON even speaks on behalf of his sailors to our federal lawmakers. And I've been very fortunate over the years to be able to do some degree of work 
for many McPons, and each has been kind enough to give me a piece of his insignia. This service dress blue coat was given to me by McPon number eight, John Hagen. The McPon identification badge at left was given to me by McPon number nine, Jim Hurt. The embroidered collar device for coveralls next to it was given to me by the 10th McPon, Terry Scott. The cap device next to it was given to me by the 11th McPon, Joe Campa. The three embroidered collar devices next to that I received from McPon number 12, Rick West. And the miniature cap device at the far right was from McPon 13, Mike Stevens. So this story of enlisted leadership has taken us a pretty long way from a day and an age where there was only one level of petty officer and there wasn't even anything on the uniform to indicate that person's level of responsibility to a continuing increase in the trust and responsibility given to senior enlisted leaders up to and including the MCPON testifying on behalf of his sailors before the Congress of the United States. To the Navy's newest chiefs, I give my congratulations. But if you savor this new role, there are greater ones ahead of you. Making Senior Chief, making Master Chief, making Command Master Chief, Fleet Master Chief, Force Master Chief. Who knows? One of you might be a future Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy. Check back soon for more content. Thanks for watching.